Welcome to the Real News Network. I'm Gregory Wilbert coming to you from Quito, Ecuador. Britain's referendum in favor of leaving or exiting the European Union, the Brexit referendum as it is also known, won with 52% of the vote on Thursday, June 23rd, stunning Europe's political establishment. One of the issues that has raised concern for many is that the Bre what does the Brexit mean for Britain's and Europe's economy and politics? This was one of the main topics leading up to the referendum, but a lot of disinformation reigned in the discussion. With us to discuss the economic and political context of uh, the Brexit is Michael Hudson. He's research professor of economics at the University of Missouri, Kansas City, and author of Killing the Host, How Financial Parasites and Debt Destroy the Global Economy. Also, he is an economics advisor to several governments, including in Greece, Iceland, Latvia, and China. He joins us right now from New York City. Thanks, Michael, for joining us. Good to be here again. So let's begin with the political context in which the Brexit vote took place. Aside from the right-wing arguments about immigrants, economic concerns, and about Britain's ability uh, to, to um, control its own economy, <clears throat> what would you say, uh, what do you see as being the main kind of uh, political background in which this context, took, uh, in which this uh, vote took place? Well, almost all the Europeans know where the immigrants are coming from. And uh, the ones that they're talking about are from the Near East. Uh, and they're aware of the fact that most of the immigrants are coming as a result of the NATO policies promoted by uh, Hillary uh, and by uh, uh, the Obama administration. The problem began in Libya. Uh, once Hillary pushed Obama to uh, destroy Libya and uh, wipe out the stable government there, uh, she turned over the arms, and Libya was a very heavily armed country. She turned over the arms to ISIS, to al Nusra, and al-Qaeda, and al-Qaeda used these arms uh, under U.S. organization to attack uh, Syria and Iraq. Now, the Syrian population the Iraqi population, uh, had no choice but either emigrate or get killed. So the, uh, when people talked about the immigration to Europe, uh, the Europeans, the French, the Dutch, the English are all aware of the fact that this is the fact that Brussels uh, is really NATO. And NATO is really run by Washington, and that it's America's uh, new uh, Cold War against Russia that's been spurring all of this uh, uh, demographic dislocation that's spreading into England, spreading into Europe, uh, and is destabilizing things. So what you're seeing with the Brexit is the result of the Obama administration's pro-war, new Cold War policy. So are you uh, saying that people voted for Brexit um, because uh, they are really, uh, that they were concerned about uh, the, the influence of the U.S., or are you saying that it's because of the backlash, because of the, uh, the, uh, the immigration that happened and uh, the, that the fact that the right wing took advantage of that? It's a combination. Uh, the right wing was indeed pushing uh, the immigrant issue, saying, wait a minute, they're threatening our jobs. But the left wing was just as vocal, and the left wing was saying, why are these immigrants coming here? They're coming here because of uh, uh, Europe's support of NATO and uh, NATO's uh, war that's uh, bombing the Near East, that is destabilizing the whole Near East and causing a flight of refugees not only from Syria, but also from uh, Ukraine. Uh, that uh, In England, many of the so-called Polish plumbers that came years ago uh, have now gone back to Poland as that country's recovered. Uh, but now the worry is a, a whole new wave of Ukrainians. And uh, basically, the U.S. policy uh, is one of destabilization. So even the right wing, while they have talked about immigrants, uh, they've also uh, denounced uh, the f fact that uh, uh, the European policy policy is run by the United States, and that you have both uh, Marie Le Pen in France saying, we want to withdraw from NATO, uh, we don't want confrontation with Russia. You had the left wing in England saying, we don't want concentration in Russia. And last week, when I was in Germany, you had the Social Democratic Party leaders uh, saying that Russia should be invited back into the G8, uh, that uh, NATO was taking a uh, a, uh, a warlike position uh, and was uh, hurting the European economy by breaking its uh, 
ties with Russia and by forcing other sanctions uh, against Russia. So uh, you have a convergence between the left and the right. And the question is, who is going to determine the terms on which uh, Europe is broken up and put back together? Will it simply be the right wing as anti-immigrants, or will it be the left saying, we want to restructure uh, the economy uh, in a way that uh, essentially avoids the austerity that is coming uh, from uh, Brussels on the one hand and from the British uh, Conservative Party on the other. And uh, again, you had Gert Wilders, uh, the leader of the Dutch nationalists, saying, we want Holland to have its own central bank. We want to be in charge of our own money. And under Brussels, uh, we cannot be in charge of our own money. That means we cannot run a budget deficit and spend money into the economy and recover with a Keynesian type policy. So uh, the whole uh, withdrawal from Europe means withdrawing from austerity. Uh, the, if you look at the voting pattern in London, uh, in England, uh, you had London to stay in, you had the uh, university centers, Oxford and Cambridge voting to stay in, you had uh, the, mo uh, the working class, the old industrial areas of the north uh, and the south, uh, you had the middle class and the industrial class saying, we're getting a really bad deal from Europe, uh, we want to oppose uh, aus austerity, and uh, uh, we, we don't want Brussels to give us uh, not only the uh, anti-labor pro-bank policies, but also the trade policy that Brussels was trying to push onto Europe, the Obama trade agreement that essentially would take uh, national economic policy out of the hands of government and put it into the hands uh, of a corporate uh, bureaucracy, uh, corporation courts, and uh, the uh, bureaucracy in Brussels that is largely pro-bank pro-corporate uh, and anti-labor. That actually brings up the issue of the uh, transatlantic uh, trade and investment partnership, or the TTIP. Um, it was one of the things that the uh, Cameron government was really pushing uh, for this relationship between the European Union and, and the United States. Um, now that uh, if uh, now that uh, Britain is presumably uh, going to be leaving the European Union, uh, don't you think that uh, this might open the possibility of uh, a, just a TTIP between Britain and the United States? In other words, uh, that it will tie. This is one of the has been one of the arguments actually of those who are who were opposed to uh, to the to uh, Britain leaving the EU. That it will tie Britain even closer to the United States than it was before, and by virtue of the fact that it's leaving Europe. I think just the opposite. I've got phone calls today from Britain, uh, and I, I've been on uh, radio uh, with Britain. Uh, the whole feeling is that this makes uh, the TTIP impossible, because you can't do a TTIP just with Britain. You have to do it with all of Europe, and this prevents uh, Europe, uh, and I think Britain too, from making this kind of trade policy. Uh, the rejection of uh, Eurozone austerity uh, is essentially a rejection of the neoliberal plan that the TTIP is supposed to be the capstone of. Mm -hmm. And um, what do you think this means then in general for Europe's future? I mean, uh, one of the things that, uh, that uh, <clears throat> one of the dangers that many perceive is that precisely that Europe is going to, uh, as a European Union, is going to fall apart. Uh, do you think that's the likely scenario here? Or, well, uh, I watched uh, Marine Le Pen today in France, and uh, you could see from her face uh, that she was overjoyed. Uh, she thinks all of a sudden, uh, almost every European interview uh, with the people, there was such an unleashing of a feeling of freedom, a feeling of, yes, we can do it. Uh, when Ireland voted not to join uh, the European Union, people just ignored the popular vote. But now it can't be uh, ignored anymore. And I think that the British vote is a catalyst for moves in uh, Spain, Italy, uh, the Five Star Movement uh, in Italy, the Podemos in Spain, to say, uh, uh, we, are, we have an alternative to Europe. Europe uh, is sort of like the Soviet Union in the 30s and 40s. There was an argument, is it reformable or not? There's a feeling, and I think it's correct, that the European Union, the Eurozone, and the Euro is not reformable as a result of the Lisbon uh, treaties and the other treaties that have uh, created the Euro. Uh, Europe has to be taken apart in order to be put together, not on a right wing, neoliberal basis, but on a more social uh, basis. 
Now, ironically, the parties that call themselves socialists are now moved to the ultra-right, to the neoliberal, uh, the French socialists, uh, the German social democrats. Uh, but you're having real radical parties arise from Italy, Spain, Portugal, uh, and uh, potentially in Greece again, uh, that are going to say, well, the key of any government, of any national government, has to be the ability to issue our own money, to run a deficit, spending into the economy to make the economy recover. We cannot recover under uh, the Lisbon agreements and under the Eurozone, where the central bank will only create money to give to banks, not money to spend into the economy to actually finance new investment and new employment. Uh, and we cannot be part of a Eurozone that uh, insists that pensions have to be cut back in order to make the banks whole and uh, save the 1% from losing money. So for the first time, you're having the real left wing in Europe talking about financial issues, not about uh, political philosophy or the fact that uh, countries are not going to go to war again. Nobody ever believes that France, Germany, and other countries in Europe are going to go to military war again. There is a fear that the countries in Europe may go to war against Russia, pushed by NATO pushed by adventurism of uh, the U.S. Uh, stance towards Russia. And so all of a sudden, the Eurozone, uh, that was supposed to be a bulwark of military peace, has become uh, belligerent, uh, and even more so if uh, Hillary would win in the United States. Uh, and there's a feeling we do want peace. That means we have to withdraw from the Eurozone. And essentially, withdrawing from Brussels means withdrawing from NATO and withdrawing from the United States. So you could say that what uh, the vote to withdraw from uh, Europe is, is really a vote uh, of the British pop middle class and the working class to withdraw from the U.S. neoliberalism that has been uh, running Europe for the last 10 years. Okay, well, uh, unfortunately, we've run out of time, but uh, thanks so much, Michael, for your uh, insight on this, uh, and uh, I'm sure we'll come back to you again, as we always do. So thanks again for joining us. Good to be here. And thank you for watching The Real News Network.